Hello YouTube, this is the July 10th, 2019 Fusion Shark Tank call featuring Dr. Heinrich Hora, Dr. Warren McKenzie from HB11. HB11 is an Australian-based fusion startup proposing to initiate hydrogen boron fusion with a set of powerful laser pulses. They're looking for an interest from potential investors. The second presentation is from Dr. Matthew Moynihan from New Light Fusion Consulting. Dr. Moynihan will provide a summary of fusion investments so far and the types of startups that you might see and pitches you might hear in this space. Hope you enjoy the call. Um, this company is HP11. Uh, they are an Australian Sydney-based company that was formed uh, at least five years ago. And they grew out of work uh, from Dr. Heinrich Cora. And so the, all three members of their uh, core team are on the call with us today. Jan is joining us from Luxembourg, so it's 3 a.m. where he is. Um, Warren and Heinrich are both in Sydney, Australia. And with that, I think I'll let them take it away. All right, well, I think, thank, thank you very much, Matthew, and thank you for the, the, uh, the opportunity to present. Um, I, uh, just a structure of this presentation, you know, aside from a, a quick introduction from myself, the first half of this talk is uh, Professor Hora is going to be uh, uh, presenting on some, some technical details, which is similar to a, a talk that was given in Hafey re recently. Um, so the context, just the outline of, of uh, who we are, the, you know, HB11, what we're presenting here is largely Professor Hora's uh, work over, over his entire career, which has been now becoming possible thanks to a bunch of advances in laser technology. Uh, myself, I'm a material scientist uh, with a lot of experience commercializing scientific breakthroughs and, and Jan uh, is, is uh, in, in charge of finance. So that's, that's the, uh, the team. And uh, with that, Heinz. Uh, yeah, thank you. Can, can should I may talk about me a little bit? Yes, <clears throat> I started the interest in this, this boron fusion in the very early years when the laser was coming along. So since uh, 1963 at Max Planck Institute in Munich, <coughs> uh, <Karching, coughs> I am involved with looking how a controlled energy um, generator, electricity generator can be done by fusion. And my, 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 my course went to many places in, including Westinghouse, Rochester University. I was also at, at, at Iowa State University for uh, one semester and many other places around the world. Now, uh, I can tell you, uh, you, we are, you, are, you are all aiming in the right direction to get a clean, uh, low cost, uh, feasible, um, and production of electricity from uh, boron fusion. And I can tell you, after my long years work, since this, all, all these um, uh, de decades, it, it is a, 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 a highlight what I was presenting um, in, 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 in May, this May, at a conference in international, in Hefei in, in, in China. At the same time, George Miley, who always was uh, close to, to my own interests, uh, we were working to, together, uh, giving an IEEE uh, see, uh, about a breakthrough to the problem. How can fusion be done at lower temperatures? It is, it is, it is a fact. The, the temperature for fusion uh, reactions is indeed hundreds of million degrees Kelvin. The, this we have to realize this this temperatures have nearly been have, have been reached also in ether in, in in NIF, but for two short times and the reactor itself is quite far away. And this is a, the, the title of, of uh, 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 Warren is so kind to put the first slide on, yep. showing reducing problem of very high temperatures. Uh, <clears throat> I, I go to the, to the uh, um, 
the question, we, we have to work with a force density in plasma segment, right? And, and the force density is given by a minus gradient of pressure. And the pressure is, is, is depending on temperature and density of the plasma we are working. Now, let's remember. Thermal pressure, uh, P, by this density and temperature, we, we remember chemical carbon, chemical reactions, you know, burning coal, it's all the problems. It was very helpful for the modern civilization, but it is, was, has now problems, clear problems, crazy problems. Uh, carbon reaction, uh, each reaction produces about electron volt energy. So the volts, the volts from a, from a battery, <laughs> um, um, chemical. And, um, but uh, so, so these reactions correspond then to, uh, to uh, uh, reactions of a few hundred degrees, 1,800 or so, is, is a, a reaction and an energy for, for a chemical carbon reaction or chemical reactions. And we must take the reality, nuclear reactions are 10 million times higher. They produce energy, each reaction, 10 MeV, not EV, 10 MeV round. And this is the reason why the temperatures for the, for the reactions have to be higher than 100 million degrees Kelvin. This, this is indeed the handicap all what all, 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 all the years and 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 we, we know this from the sun in the sun uh, the slide number three <clears throat> the sun gets energy from burning hydrogen into helium and we know in the center of the sun the temperature is 15 million degrees uh, centigrade or kelvin and <clears throat> This is indeed the, 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 the matter we have to get under control. I give only, uh, ITER can, can indeed work with, with a few, 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 um, with a few, few um, dozens of, 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 of uh, degrees centigrade. You know, the tokamak, uh, as, 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 as ITER, <clears throat> Uh, 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 having having a rotate uh, this is this, this, this uh, do not like big very huge plasma uh, to uh, pro produce this, this energy indeed not long enough and for instance in, in this do not uh, uh, what you see in this picture this, this plasma should continuously work for uh, hours and weeks and produce energy but uh, it is it is it's a reality. The present level of the tokamak makes the um, an eight minute minutes reaction uh, not not before 2037. So this is the reality. And or using then uh, laser pulses, this this uh, the, the biggest laser uh, uh, on on Earth with a NIF. Um, five million billion dollars. The, uh, wonderful work was what by by uh, Mike Campbell and and and, and Livermore. And the whole whole nation is, is is to be congratulated. But again, the the the, 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 the laser pulses in nanosecond range. We have to look to shorter times. To to. Uh, or here, a, 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 a picture from 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 Melanie, Melanie Win, Windrich, a very very powerful science author uh, in, in 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 England. She is asked, <laughs> "Fusion energy always seems to be thirty years away." This is, this is not, not 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 a question for for joking. Melanie Windrich, Windrich gives a real um, um, uh, outlook. Now, <clears throat> I had uh, shown you first the force density in a plasma, the simple in a prime, uh, um, uh, initial physics. So it's given by P 
by the pressure, a thermal pressure. But there is also, can also, uh, forces be produced, the nonlinear forces. And, um, um, and they are forces which are only given by electric and magnetic fields, E and H. Indeed, if using the lasers, we have to have the frequency omega of, of, the, of, the, of the laser pulse. And we have also to consider the, 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 N, the, the, the uh, <coughs> optical constant of, of the refractive index taking into account. But temperature is also <laughs> produced, but the key force is then in the, in the electromagnetic field. And this is given by the Maxwellian stress tensor and all these details. Now, where, where can one see this? A wonderful uh, result was by Lindor in, in, uh, in, in Malibu in, uh, in, in the US aircraft uh, in, 80, in 63. He had the wonderful uh, uh, laser pulses um, made, made by, by um, uh, uh, <clears throat> 10, 10 or so nanosecond duration, very precise pulses, firing the pulses onto a target. And what happened for pulses up to 1 million, 1 megawatt pulses, very short megawatt, was a real, what, what, what is expected, the laser produced, produced a very, in the focus on the target, wonderful hot plasma, it was few 10,000 so, um, uh, degree centigrade. You could, could see this from the radiation. And, and the expansion of this plasma was fully classically hydrodynamic um, plasma expansion as expected up to the pulses of, of megawatt. And when Linlaw <laughs> increased the, the, the power only by a factor two or three. What happened? The classical values below, at less, had, had ion energies, could measure ion energies of few electron volts, three, four, as expected classically by hydro. Sorry, Heinz, I might be hydro mechanical. Yeah, but what happened above megawatt? Suddenly, he measured kilo KEV ions. Uh, he, um, Linda was immediately promoted to the DOE, or as a name at this time. Uh, 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 to, we have no fusion. But the uh, disappointment was these KEV ions. They are not thermal. So they are separated in blocks depending on, on the charge of the ions and showing there is an electromagnetic mechanism behind. And I had the chance from this early years, 63, 65, and so on, to watch where are these nonlinear processes. Which slide are we up to? I, I, I'm now uh, this, this uh, um, moment, uh, after, Moment. Uh, I I I am now with with, with the picture where, where you you see a black a black part in the center uh, the middle and 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 and, and photos. Yeah, got it. You have it. Yeah, this was a result. Uh, I had the fortune to evaluate when working at Westinghouse. They had about hundred uh, few few hundred results. Uh, I could evaluate. The, uh, and on this picture, you see the following. They were dropping about uh, very, very tiny aluminum spheres down. And, and from the left hand side, laser uh, fires, uh, pulses of, they are fired on it. And, and, and at the different times, then uh, photos showed what plasma. Uh, in the middle is a, is a case. This is a photo, photo of at, 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 at 250 nanoseconds, and you, you, what you see. 
what you see is in the center you have a little wonderful spherical uh, plasma. And evaluating the, the velocities and so on showed this central plasma was really wonderful, thermal, hypodynamic, all perfectly also followed up in, in com com computations. But there was also this half moon like part around. Uh, this was plasma expanding much faster against the laser light and and then evaluating velocities and uh, the, size, the amount of energy of, of the laser pulse and water, one could see this was not definitely not a thermal process, it was a definitely a nonlinear process, the increase of the uh, of the uh, of the energy of the ions was nearly by a square law, not by the usual square root law or what about the hydrodynamics. So, and there were many other, other cases where one could see, no, not many, but a, a number where you had, could see there are nonlinear processes. An example is in the following slide. You see uh, uh, there is a, a hump in the middle do you have it, uh, Warren? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. there. The, the, the hump is, 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 is the uh, electron density of a slab of plasma, uh, theoretically, computation. From the left hand side, the uh, lowercase n is the refractive index, so when vacuum it is one, and as soon as the laser pulse hits, then now the, 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 the hump. Uh, the refractive index goes from one down to low values, half or even one tenth or so. And simplified, no collisions happen when the, the, the laser light leaves on the, on the, on the right hand side again uh, with, with the refractive index of the vacuum. And the forces uh, get, are shown by the arrows. There is a, 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 a non-thermal mechanism to produce a, a block going from the, on one side to the left and on the other side, other side to the right, two blocks of plasma. So this is, this is, we, are, we are driven one against the other as a kind of a, of a dielectric, non-thermal, a, a dielectric optical explosion. So this was indeed a, a, a first view. These computations were indeed very, very uh, simplified. No collisions, no heating, and uh, usual heating was there. And, um, and uh, we needed then, uh, this was also one of the products what I worked in at Westinghouse, uh, to get then a, a more general um, 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 formula for the forces. Uh, a lot of these things were done before from my famous people. Uh, and, uh, but uh, the, 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 the details were, were rather uh, complicated and had to be completed. This was one of the theoretical results of the equation of motion. And with this, one could then uh, I could then use uh, for, 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 uh, uh, very, uh, very, very clever uh, uh, computer colleague, the uh, hydrodynamic code, Rick Kinsinger in, in Rochester, um, to, to have then a very uh, general and precise code with heating and, and motion of, of electrons and ions. Wonderful. But they had not included the forces which I have had shown before, which made this explosion. I was simply only adding this, and uh, one result is in the following. Now you have here, under ultra high acceleration, and um, this was is a computer result from uh, 1978, though I was uh, one of my first uh, PhD students when I was in, in Australia. Um, uh, well, uh, 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 resulting in the following. 
you see the, the straight line is is the energy density uh, of the laser field and on the right hand side it, it, it goes up so the laser comes from the right hand side and uh, to, to the number 50 50 micrometer and then comes the plasma and the plasma makes the, the refractive index makes a higher a con higher concentration of 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 electromagnetic energy and the negative gradient pushes the, the plasma against the laser light from the right hand side and in the uh, uh, lower uh, 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 lower thickness values then you have a kind of a metallic response of the plasma uh, uh, that is de decreasing the power and and pushing the plasma to the left hand side so we have again the two blocks but now in all details and it's interesting when you look on the right hand side the velocity the velocity of it was the deuterium plasma from between 10 to 7 8 centimeters per second up to 10 to 10 this is, is, is an, <laughs> still low, small, low enough compared to the speed of light but the, the velocity uh, the acceleration during the uh, during the comp computed picoseconds picosecond computation or there is so the, 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 the acceleration was more than 10 to 20 centimeters per second square this was an, a horribly high acceleration and this acceleration was then measured uh, not so not so easy not so quick uh, thanks to the uh, uh, Nobel Prize uh, honored um, last year's uh, the, the pulse laser pulses developed through all the years to see uh, to, to measure by Sauerbrei uh, this was in Göttingen after he came from America uh, uh, in it was he was measuring uh, the, 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 uh, the plasma moving against the laser light by by the Doppler shift of spectral lines. He could really see that I shifted blue. The plasma was moving against the laser light, and they had and and Sauerbrei saw the 10 to 20 centimeters per second accelerations, and this was very close in, in agreement with what, what, what he had computed many years before and it, it was difficult to, to reproduce it it was reproduced uh, by, by Feldish and others in Hungary and and uh, and the essential result was also it was necessary that the laser pulse had a high contrast long story contrast and this was 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 uh, shown was in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a most ingenious experiment done by Xie Zhang. Um, he was for five years in, 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 in Rutherford Lab in, in England, in uh, Appleton, and could show the laser pulses had to have the quality um, that only during the last few picosecond pulse duration. They that that the, 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 mechan, the acceleration mechanisms had to go, and to avoid the so-called relativistic self focus also a long story, and he could show this in the most ingenious way. Uh, I was in contact with his experiments uh, and, and, and discussions since about 1900, uh, uh, 99, 80, 98, and it, it was uh, he made his. Uh, uh, Going back to China, Xi uh, Zhang, uh, uh, and a rocket-like career. He is now the vice president of the Chinese Academy of Science. Anyhow, this is true, and uh, and so we were waiting, so to say, to see this, this to, to see this next slide. The, the two plasma blocks. The, the light was coming here on the on this on this slide on from the left hand side on a target. Producing then these two plasma blocks exploding, and uh, and and also one going into the target and another uh, moving against the laser beam. And 
uh, also, the, these plasma blocks were wonderful uh, for accelerators because they contained space charged neutral electrons. They had indeed the same velocity as the ions, much less energy mo of motion. But, uh, and you could see you have you produce ion current densities of 10 to 14 amps per square centimeter. This was a million times higher than the best accelerator could produce. As, as, uh, uh, this was an, another very important result. Where could one see this more? There were also experiments from the, uh, around the same time uh, measuring, making a very, very, very simple measurements. And firing laser pulses on, 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 on deuterated targets the deuterium, we knew the neutrons are produced, but not enough for, for a power generator. And all the, the long line you see is from very short pulses, from femtosecond pulses up to nanosecond pulses. So they are all nearly on, on this, on, on this, on this one, one line. But an exception was the measurement N, uh, 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 N98. Uh, this was by by Peter Norris from uh, uh, from uh, also at at at, 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 the, at the Epic Laboratory in, in England. Norris is now a great shot of uh, professor at at, at, at uh, um, University of of of, uh, of, uh, of Oxford. Yeah, and you could see in his case. The, the ion the neutron numbers are 10,000 times higher than all the others. 10,000. And this was also a proof. This could be done only by, by, the, by the block acceleration of the front part of the, of the laser, of, of the interaction. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and fortunately, it was not, not, not so, not, it was, was a, a great riddle for the experts how this is possible. But it was thanks to the Josef Krasa in Prague. He evaluated and compared all these things and could show this is a very exceptional case. And thanks to this Krasa diagram, as I call it always, you could see another clear case of this ultra high acceleration. And now comes an experiment uh, uh, which was uh, is so singular, and and and, and the, but the attention was uh, with experts as a curiosity, extreme curiosity. This was a PhD thesis by by um, uh, Sven Steinke, Steinke at the uh, University in Berlin. He made the experiments in in in, in uh, in the Max Born Institute, as it's now called, and and there's the following: they, they had the miraculous technique to handle uh, diamond layers, diamond films of of few picometer of, of of few. I'm sorry, uh, not picometer, na nanometer diamond. Please excuse this. Nanometer thick diamond layers, the P is an N. And uh, this, and so it was extremely thin. When they fired, uh, uh, they are, they are indeed, because they called laser pulses from Ala, uh, Ala Nobel laureates, uh, um, uh, Moreau and, and, and uh, uh, Strickland fired on such a very thin uh, nano, 80 nanometer uh, diamond uh, layer, the, the light was completely ex ex exchanged, converted into ion energy. No light, light went through. It was not, not a tunnel effect or whatever, what is really known. It, 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 was, it, it, it showed within this very small volume uh, the whole laser pulse energy was converted into ions, ion, uh, uh, ion motion. And this corresponded then to a, 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 a production of 
the laser pulse now for this very small vol small volume, 10 to, 10 to 12 joule per cubic centimeter. And this is exactly an, an energy, not, not a thermal energy. It was motion of ions. And, and, and their energy was indeed then, uh, ready for the, for the reaction, not, not for diamond, but for the reaction of boron with, 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 with hydrogen. Nearly the same numbers of densities and so on in solid state. So this, this has been shown. And you can also cal calculate uh, under these conditions the, uh, any, any thermal pressure is about two orders of magnitude lower. This was a, a, the first time to, to, to see how the, 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 the chirp pulse amplified uh, extremely high power because the cold laser pulses from 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 Moho and Strickland have produced fusion uh, can produce the fusion energy at at reasonably uh, technically engineering type uh, uh, reactors. We had also uh, uh, the steps to this. We are also coming then to a, a reactor design, and fortunately also. Yeah, now, and, and now you see, and, and this, this story uh, was where, where uh, um, uh, Warren can describe the, uh, the, the reactor design. Indeed, the, the, our first paper on which also our patents are found, founded, this, 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 was published also under the co-authorship of Bourou, with whom we had all the time the contact. And uh, it is, so to say, also under his name, the paper. Uh, and, and from there on, we had a few other papers, uh, 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 the different steps following, then with, uh, with, uh, uh, now with under the roof of the HP11 company. But I think this is now that what, what uh, uh, Warren was going to continue. Yeah, uh, 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 I should still say it is a very important um, point. Yeah. Um, um, to, to mention, the moment. Warren, do you want to? Do you want to get started? Warren, uh, yeah, oh, yeah. Go ahead. Kind of running over time. I'm sorry, uh, Warren. That's all right. Uh, I, Matthew, I can run through this as quick or as slow as you like. How long have we got? Go ahead. Yeah. Get, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. All right. I'll, I'll do. I'll do the reasonably quick one. Um. Uh, obviously, I, I, like I, I mentioned earlier, Jan, Jan's in charge of finance. I'm generally in charge of commercial direction, and, and Heinz is the pioneer of, of this approach, which uh, we've patented and, and used to form as the basis of HP11. So this is the the investor pitch. Um, I, I think, you know, based on the introductions, most people know about the different types of, of fusion energy. Um, we, I guess, are radically new because we're, we're one of the one of the few who were looking at the hydrogen boron approach, which was considered too difficult until very recently. So, the, you know, how to achieve hydrogen boron was, you know, largely, largely what we just heard from Heinz. But what has changed there is a bunch of advances in uh, mainly laser technology. First, the demonstration of, of the high magnetic field in the kilotesla range out of Japan, um, advances in laser and laser physics, uh, but also, and and Heinz touched on this, um, you know, you know, using using lasers, we we know that we can get hydrogen boron reactions, but to get enough reactions to make it useful, uh, you know, the observation of an avalanche or a chain reaction, um, which, which Heinz mentioned, is is probably the key to actually. Uh, us being, you know, our our approach being one that can actually produce um, significant gains of energy. So we've got a patent which uh, basically encompasses, you know, the high magnetic field and the use of the lasers, and obviously uh, takes advantage of of the avalanche reactions. So um, <clears throat> I think we we skipped over this uh, towards the end of Heinz's slide, but uh, you know, on the left there, there's the reaction unit. So there's 
the the coil in yellow, which creates the uh, magnetic field from the pulse from laser one, and that that's simultaneous. Oh, kilo, kilo Tesla, extreme also extremely high fields uh, achieved by by my Japanese colleagues and others uh, in, in Osaka. All new and they only help to work then with a cylindrical blue part in the, in, 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 in the loops. We need this cylindrical because for spherical, we would need not, not petabot laser pulses, we would need exabot, and this is too far away. But with a cylindrical, we can get in the reaction, which is in, in the center of, of a big sphere. Yeah. Uh, okay. We're producing right. hydrogen boron, the, the, the alphas. Yeah. Go ahead. Right, go ahead. So on 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 the right there, you can see there's a sphere with this reaction unit in the center. One of the nice features of the approach that we're that we're taking is, you know, once we pulse these two lasers and get an explosion of alpha particles or, or charged helium, uh, we're actually directly collecting those those uh, ions uh, in in the sphere. So so as they're neutralized when they hit the sphere, that actually directly creates the charge. And to stop the explosion actually generating heat, um, you know, where, where the ions have a lot of energy when they come into, into contact with, with the sphere, uh, the sphere is actually held at, at, a, at a voltage to decelerate those ions as they approach it. Um, so again, uh, and I, I probably don't, don't need to go through this in detail, but the reason that this is possible now is largely completely explained by you know, the Nobel Prize in Physics behind Chirp Pulse Amplification by uh, Gerard Maru. Um, and, and those lasers can reach the intensities that, that we need based on some of Professor Hora's predictions um, previously. So as far as the company goes, uh, you know, the, we're, we're largely, we're, we're pretty much at the end of the establishment phase where we've, we formed the company, we published a scientific roadmap, um, did a little bit of media around that and got 40,000 reads, I think in the first month. Um, credibility is everything. Um, so you know a lot of people don't understand well most people don't understand fusion so you know partly to guide the scientific implementation of the roadmap but also to give us credibility as an approach we we put together a, a panel of high profile researchers um who who i'll, I'll mention uh, i've got a slide on just at the end and uh developing the fundraising strategy now to date uh, we are in the position where we're about to start fundraising. The approach that we've, we've looked for initially is, is to use an equity crowdfunding model. And the reason for that is particularly for funds just really not well suited to the next stage that we're looking at, which is essentially a bunch of international collaborations. So essentially we're, we're funding a research project and that, that doesn't fit well with, with a lot of uh, venture funds. So we're looking at the equity crowdfunding model. Um, as as uh, Jan, Jan is leading this, one thing that we are learning is uh, even an equity crowdfunding campaign in itself is something that's not easy to establish. So it, you know, if there's any investors out there, what we are looking for originally is basically a little bit of working capital to get to get started of, of the order of, of a million or a couple of million dollars, um, basically to get our administration and a, and a, a PR campaign um, and company structure around the equity crowdfunding. And if we have a little bit more money, we might start some uh, seed experiments just to de-risk uh, that investment. The international collaboration piece, we, you know, we expect to be in the order of $10 million. The aim of that is to demonstrate the, a, a proof concept of the reactor, not in a central facility, but in other laboratories. And at the end of that, after we've got the proof of concept, we'll have a pile of intellectual property and then we'll be set up to do uh, what would be a more traditional uh, venture fundraising to build the prototype reactor. So um, again, in the interest of time, um, I, I do have a little bit on, on market there, but I think I'll just flash this, the slides up. Um, probably a, an important one for, for those who are not familiar with the, the hydrogen boron reaction. The main advantages of it is there are no radioactive byproducts or at least primary by, byproducts. Um, the hydrogen and boron are both abundant and radioactive and not radioactive, so they're easy to handle. Um, I think the point which I mentioned when I described the, the reactor is that um, because the, the concept as we have it at the moment creates electricity directly, not heat which needs to be transferred into electricity via a heat exchanger and turbines, etc. The capital cost of a, of a reactor or generator is going to be considerably lower 
uh, which means that you know they, these uh, you know the, the distribution of, of of energy, you know hydrogen boron energy sources could be uh, more widely distributed and put a, a lower have a lower dependency on the grid. Now, we have put some earlier cost estimates of what the, the price of this would be. Uh, we, you know, it's obviously very early days, but we do expect that the price for generation will be a fraction of that of, of coal-fired power. But again, that's a very early estimate. Um, here is the team. Uh, just to flash that slide up for the internet. Um, I, I do have to go through our scientific advisory board. Um, Mike Campbell um, from from LLE, uh, Shalom Eliza from from sorry research facility, Roland Salbri from um, uh, from from the Helmholtz Zentrum, uh, and George Miley from University of Illinois. And if anyone wants to contact us, uh, that there's our email addresses. Hi, this is Sam. I've got a question. Where's this? Uh, you said you published a paper. Is that available somewhere? Uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, it, it it is on the HB11 website. Uh, I'm sure if you Google uh, hydrogen boron fusion horror um, roadmap, you'll you'll it'll come up first. Go. Okay, I'll find it on the website. Thanks. Uh, any other questions? That we're kind of running over. Um, anything? I think that your nonlinear theory been incorporated in the computer codes of Livermore, like last night. Uh, Mine's you there. Uh, one second. Uh, Cambridge University Press. Warren, have you done? Heinz, Heinz, uh, can you repeat your answer there? Where hmm. is published? Uh, I, I, the best source is, is the paper which is just uh, coming out the next days from the American Nuclear Society, from the conference uh, last uh, November, uh, 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 George Miley presented uh, in, in Florida, uh, for an, I, an I triple, uh, this was an uh, American Nuclear Society paper. Uh, you, you have my email address, uh, I'm happy to, to, to give you some references. Um, Warren, my biggest, my biggest uh, question is with HB11, the laser pulse is so high energy that I, I feel like the, the iteration between idea, test, data, refinement of idea is kind of long. Do you want to address that? Yeah. Uh, Go on. Yeah, if I could say, it is, it is, it is, it is really um, very unexpected compared to the hundreds of million degrees the normal uh, thermal pressure that we can get rid of the brimstone emission and all the other trouble while giving this energy, wasting the energy not in, into electrons and converting the energy uh, according to Steinke directly in iron motion for, for nuclear collisions to give this a result. Okay. That's, that's the answer. Okay. Um, if there aren't any other questions, I'm going to move on. Uh, I'm going to keep my presentation very, very short because I know we all have precious time. Um, okay? Cool. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, Okay. 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 Um, so uh, my name is Dr. Matthew Moynihan, and I've been in fusion since 2006. Um, what I'm going to be presenting tonight is not technical. It's going to be a summary of the fusion space as I see it. Uh, so I have a, a couple of numbers here. Uh, including staffing levels, funding amounts, and number of private organizations that are going after nuclear fusion. Um, people have asked me where I get my numbers, and you can get them from press releases, uh, from venture capitalists, or the companies themselves, or the SBIR websites. A number of these companies have SBIR grants and other things. So, um, first is going to be a short history of fusion. Then we're going to do the snapshot, which is really the, the, good, the good part of the talk. 
uh, on the number, the amount of private investment that has gone into these companies. I'm going to talk briefly about the public side, and then I'm going to go through three types of companies that you will see in the fusion space. Um, for longtime fusion watchers, uh, this slide is probably not information, but for those of us who are not familiar with fusion, fusion was first discovered in 1933. It was observed at Cavendish Laboratory by Dr. Mark Oliphant. He was doing a particle accelerator model where he was flying fusion at a wall and he was observing neutrons. Um, Ivy Mike was the first atomic bomb that was powerful enough to kick off fusion reactor reactions. But of course, that's not very useful. You need to be able to do fusion in a building and not blow yourself up. So uh, the first machine that you could consider a fusion machine was Scalia 1. And that was in the winter of 1958. It was a theta pinch machine. It was a tube of, of plasma current dumped down the side, causing an implosion, which caused fusion. The next important date, I'd say, is when they shut down T uh, they, they turned on TFTR at Princeton, uh, which was a major tokamak. It, it was a big red, red letter day in the uh, history of, of tokamaks. And there's a picture over here on the right. There's Harold Firth. Uh, they actually tried to turn this on before Christmas Eve, but they, they couldn't. The clock stopped and they, they it went in over into the next day and they called it powered on um, the next day. Um, in, the next important date is when MFTF shut down. I, I call that an important milestone in the history of fusion. MFTF was a magnetic mirror machine. It was, uh, the US was engaged in a large magnetic mirror program over a 15 year period. And the MFTF was the largest machine ever built in Livermore history to that date, most expensive. And they turned it on and they shut it down the same day. It was, it was a, very famous, very fateful day in the history of nuclear fusion that the general public really doesn't appreciate. And when they shut down the MFT, if it marked the fall of the mirror machine and the rise of the tokamak as really the, the number two solution. So you know, laser fusion in the US or tokamak fusion. And that uh, tokamaks and ICF pretty much dominated the space for uh, about two decades. Uh, and some would argue it still dominates today. Um, for those who don't know, in 1997, the JET Joint European Taurus tokamak pulled 16 megawatts of power out of a fusing plasma. And this was uh, a, an important milestone in the history of fusion because it's right now it's the record, it, officially. The most amount of power pulled out of fusion. And people have debated about what the ratio is. Um, and I, I could go in a whole side discussion about how much money, how much energy it took to drive the tokamak. But the numbers I have are 100 megawatts. I think another important date is in 1999 when Richard Hull fused the atom in his uh, garage in Richmond, Virginia. And this marked the beginning of a amateur fusion community, which is now with us. Um, Richard was one of the first examples of this, and he started this Fuser.net community, which has since trained about 100 to 200 people that can do nuclear fusion in their garage using a simple fuser. So it's an it's it's intricate, interesting, and integral part of the fusion world, and I think it doesn't get as much attention as it deserves. Um, in 2000, a company named NSD Gradle, which was a European company, took uh, the fuser and commercialized it into a neutron generator. And I think this is just important in the sense that we put nuclear fusion in the commercial marketplace. So after 2000, you could go out and buy a machine that would do nuclear fusion and you could purchase it. So it's a sign that fusion is kind of moving out of, it's moving into the space of, of commercialization. And then lastly, um, I, I just picked the Tokamak Energy milestone. Tokamak Energy is a startup company in England and they were able to run their ST uh, tokamak for 29 hours straight. So that's an important uh, milestone. Although their, their machine was run cold, so they weren't doing nuclear fusion. So this is just a short history of important milestones in nuclear fusion. Um, a word on the technology. Um, if, you're, if a fusioneer was a painter, their palette would have six colors, electric field, magnetic field, ions, electrons, um, 
lead lithium and, and laser systems. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to manipulate all these factors to get the ions to slam together and fuse. Now, when they slam together, they get really, really close, within two femtometers. And when they do that, there's a quantum tunneling effect which causes them to do nuclear fusion. So that's, and, and if you read and learn about these companies, you start to see these, these trends where their companies are trying to manipulate each one of these factors to get the plasma to do what it wants. Now, in a lot of cases, a company will use a plasma trick or an innovation to give them an edge. So those are sort of the enabling things that make fusion possible, whereas in the past it was not possible or it was more difficult. So for example, uh, you can think of plasma as a fluid that conducts electricity. So as it conducts electricity, it also generates a magnetic field. So this, this allows you to create smoke rings of plasma that will self-contain themselves. So that gives rise to things called spheromax, FRCs and other things like pictomines, which are helices of plasma. In all cases, they're using this to give them an edge. They're trying to use some trick in the plasma behavior to make the reactor more feasible, to give them an advantage. So plasma can be structured into loops. I, I saw one company in Boston raise $3 million FP generation based on the idea that the plasma ions in a beam will naturally bunch together. That was an observation from mass spec research. And the entrepreneur decided that we could tune that effect up to fusion conditions. And he was able to raise $3 million based on that concept. Now, FP generation didn't work out. They had a problem where the ions, when the ions turn around, they spend a lot of time in one space and they fly apart. And the problems with beams are well understood. So, if you're an investor in this space, you're walking into a bit of a minefield and you've got to understand that there's things that have been tried and so you've got to do your research, you've got to do your homework. Now, and, oh, I, I forgot to mention, optimization with technology like superconductors is uh, another very exciting thing. Superconductors can run typically a million times longer, which allows you to go from a capacitor-based machine, which is a short pulse, high uh, electrical energy device to a continuous flowing machine. So that's a game changer. And in some magnetic configurations like the tokamak, fusion rates scale as the magnetic field to exponential powers. So if you can run longer with a superconductor and you get stronger fields, you'll have a huge, it's a game changer for fusion. So. In summary, companies are using plasma tricks and technical innovation to try to push fusion further forward. Now, all of these machines, you must understand, are optimization problems. So if you look at a, a, at a machine that's proposed by a startup, it's gonna have 50 knobs, magnetic field strength, electrical current, laser pulse, laser density, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you're standing in front of this board with 50 knobs and you're trying to basically explore the operating space or optimize the system to get more behavior that you love and less behavior that you hate to try to get the most fusion rate the most efficient way possible. Now, a good experimentalist will use dimensional analysis, basically group the variables together using dimensionless numbers like the Reynolds number, for instance, in fluids to try to reduce the number of knobs from 50 to 10 or from 10 to five. And then we'll couple that with experimental codes to model different operating conditions to sort out where the good behavior is, the bad behavior is, where we want to operate our machine, where we want to avoid our machine, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you'll see that a lot in, in pitches that you'll get from fusion startups. Um, lastly, uh, a lot's been said about the Lawson uh, triple product and the Lawson criteria. Um, the way I always explain it is the Lawson energy balance, which is when John Lawson wrote his landmark paper in 1957, he was an engineer. And the first thing he did was apply an energy balance across a plasma-based fusion reactor. So if your machine is not plasma-based, then of course this wouldn't necessarily apply to you. 
but he envisioned it like a sun in a building, essentially. And so for that system, there's a simple equation for, for tracking the amount of energy. It's net power equals the fusion rate, so the rate that fusion is generating elect uh, excess energy, minus the conduction. So anytime mass touches a, a metal surface, it's conducted away. And when it's conducted away, it pulls some energy with it. So it's an energy loss mechanism. Minus radiation. So plasma is bleeding energy away as light. That could be visible, UV, IR, X-ray, whatever. Energy is constantly bleeding off the plasma, and that's bad. That's a loss mechanism. We don't like that. And then the whole thing is times efficiency. So that's the overall efficiency of your machine. So, for example, if you pick a technology like superconductors, what you're essentially doing is driving up the efficiency of your machine. That's what superconductors would do there, so it plays in that term. If you do something like you make a lot of space around your plasma so that it doesn't touch any walls, that drives, up, that drives down the conduction rate. So I like this energy balance. And then, of course, people have taken this as the basis and then done a whole series of math and applied lots of assumptions or other things to get to this triple product that we hear so much about. Anyway, so this slide is a summary slide and it's for all the data scientists that are watching this presentation. Um, I, I've been keeping for a number of years a spreadsheet of investments in private entities. So this is a list of private entities um, that are currently active. To, I think two or three of them are actually shut down. They're currently, there's two of them that are, that are not entities anymore and they're listed there. But these are private entities that are pursuing fusion in some way. They're not necessarily fusion, looking for fusion power. So I've highlighted some of them. So for instance, the ones in green, the three and the four in green, are pursuing fusion for space applications. They wanna build a fusion rocket engine, or a rocket-driven fusion reactor. So those three are highlighted in green. Um, there's three in purple, and these businesses, these three, Fuse, Pulsar, and Renaissance, their business model is not necessarily to get fusion power. They want to become services, servicers, providers, or licenses, licensors for fusion. So they want to sub, sub license or subcontract or provide um, support diagnostics for fusion companies. And then the last two I've got here are in dark red. And these companies, Phoenix and Shine Medical Technologies, are using fusion for neutron generators and then using the neutrons to make medical isotopes or do neutron radiography. Both those companies are very successful and they both were spun out of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, Phoenix was in 2005 and Shine was in 2010. And Dr. Sanitarius, who's on this call, uh, was instrumental in helping train Ross Radel and Greg to, to eventually start those companies. Okay, um, so just to briefly on, go on. Okay, uh, briefly, on the, on the government side of the house, um, we have about a billion plus dollars for nuclear fusion, and that's split evenly between the National Nuclear Administ Security Administration, so the weapons side of the house for the U.S., and the, the straight nuclear fusion research group. So um, the NNSA funds weapons research, and that's your laser systems, your ICFs, your Omega, your NIF, your, some of your subcontractors like your General Atomics, et cetera, and the University of Rochester LLE where I got my PhD. On the fusion energy side of the house, um, that money goes through the Office of Fusion Energy Sciences, and they distribute that out to the national laboratories, and most of that money does go to tokamaks. Um, 125 million of that 500 goes to the U.S. ITER involvement in, in ITER. Um, so these, the, the DOE Office of Energy Sciences is sort of closely aligned with the FESAC Committee, the Fusion Energy Sciences and Advisory Committee, and the National Academy of Sciences. Both those boards are 50 to 100 uh, appointed people, a lot of them university professors or national lab scientists, who write reports and recommend initiatives which uh, Congress would fund or not fund 
Um, so for instance, the report on burning plasma comes through these guys. And they're very closely aligned. So they're, they're sort of of one mind oftentimes. Um, and I would say that all of this, this whole framework, including the amounts and the mandates for all the groups is really set by Congress. So unfortunately, if we want to see a major change in fusion funding on the, on the government side, we really need Congress. And I wish it wasn't true, but we really have to climb that high to get the changes that we might want, for example. Now, I would also say that ARPA-E got involved in fusion in 2014 with the Alpha program. And at the time, it wasn't totally well received at the DOE because there was some kerfuffle between whether the DOE should fund fusion exclusively or if ARPA-E is allowed to get involved in that space. Those Alpha grants, there was a $30 million program for those who don't know. And they, they awarded nine companies and teams of roughly three million apiece to do uh, fusion studies. And that program made a big impact. For a small amount of money, they made a huge impact in terms of experimental results and um, progression by the teams. The Alpha program is now closed. The grants closed at the end of last year. So ARPA-E has followed up with this open program, which are roughly the same amounts of money. And a lot of that's going through Scott Sue, um, and he's out administering the funds. So they've been investing in groups like Zap Energy, for example, a company out of the University of Washington, for instance. One last thing, fusion funding on the public side is generally up, which is great. Um, if you look at the plot, I don't know if you can see it um, over here, uh, the, the funding amounts are up for about 20 years we were kind of low. I mean, ICF and, and MCF traded places when they were building NIF, there was a heck of a lot more, more money for ICF. But, but in general, the funding amounts are up, so that's great. Okay, I'm gonna keep this short. There are three kinds of companies, if you look at the whole space that I see that are playing in this space. The first one is an innovator model, which is pretty much one or two people come up with an innovation that they really believe is going to do nuclear fusion. And their goal is mainly to get net power. And they work really, really hard and they're very committed to this. And if you ever meet one of these people, they are out there, give them a heck of a lot of respect because it is tough as hell to get support for nuclear fusion if you're coming from just a general place, if you're not coming from a national laboratory or university or whatever but you do see them. General, uh, the classic example is General Fusion. Um, Michel Labarge, he did not come out of an academic setting right when he started the company. He had been working for 10 years in the printing industry and then had his uh, you know, midlife crisis and decided to start a nuclear fusion company. And what he did was he was using tricks with technical innovations like the new control and timing that they had available and plasma tricks. So it usually takes a, a founder like that five to 10 years to get their first investment. That's typically how long it takes. And a lot of those guys are living during that time off their own money. And I've seen, I saw one company eight years and over that eight year period, they lived off about $200,000 in small investments they got from friends and family and other things before they got their first $3 million major investment. Um, so that's usually the first ask. Usually the first ask is about $3 million for two years to build a prototype. That's typically what I see as the model. And through that time, they try to build credibility. They will often build credibility through simulations, um, an online presence, I've seen that model work. Um, academic papers are certainly useful. And they'll try to point to similar technologies. So for example, Horn Technologies is a good company and they try to equate themselves to Lockheed Martin. So what they'll say is, if you like Lockheed Martin's approach, you'll love what we're doing. Um, one word about these companies, one thing about them is they can get tunnel vision, which is a problem and they can be secretive. And when I see a secretive company, I tend to stay away. Um, if you ever meet somebody who says they have a great fusion idea, but they need you to sign an NDA, that's typically a red flag for me. So I like companies that are more open because if you've got a good idea, you gotta let it out. Okay, um, the second model is the institutional model. 
these are folks like a group of national laboratory scientists or a group of university students or professors or grad students that are going to come out and they're going to take something they've built in the lab and they're going to commercialize it. So with this team, funding usually comes quicker because they're building off a reputation. The downside is that they tend to be more academically focused. So they'll focus more on papers and less on maybe commercialization. So what would be great is if we could find some MBAs that could partner with these guys. For instance, Compact Fusion Systems is a wonderful company. And luckily, they got a really good business guy um, to join them. And if they hadn't had that, I think they would be not as, in, not as a strong um, team as they, as they could be or they would be. Um, but yeah, it, and also I would say MBAs don't tend to, to join fusion startups because MBAs tend to go where there's lots of money and there isn't lots of money in fusion presently. So it is hard to convince the business types to join the academics, but if you're a business type and you, you wanna get involved, find one of these groups that are coming out of a national laboratory and join them. And oftentimes they are using a plasma trick or an innovation. I'm gonna move on. Okay, so the third type is not as common, but we're starting to see more of these companies. And these are people that don't go after nuclear fusion power explicitly. They want to do something with the nuclear fusion. So neutron radiography, I mentioned earlier, is a, is a new and emerging space. Uh, Phoenix Nuclear Labs just opened a brand new neutron radiography center. They are doing nuclear fusion but they are using it to image the inside of bullets and they're doing, they're doing imaging where you can't, you can't do it with x-rays, for example. Um, also medical isotopes. FUSE is, is another example. Their model is they're a clearing house. So it's a committee of smart people. They accept ideas from everywhere, every, any place. And then they evaluate and rank the ideas. And if you're in the top four, for example, they might license patent or license the technology that comes out of that. So they're kind of, they're kind of, a, that's their business model, it's a fusion clearing house. We even have examples of fusion consulting businesses. So for instance, Woodruff Scientific makes its living off of winning small contracts to support national labs, for example. So a typical contract for them might be $500,000 and they pull in consultants, work on that project. When the contract is done, they let everybody you know, go their separate ways, and then they move on to the next contract. So there is a company that does does that. Um, there are all also other markets for fusion. Uh, rockets, I mentioned. Um, cancer treatment. Uh, TAE Life Sciences just spun, they spun out in 2017. They developed a product for boron neutron capture therapy. So for a million dollars, you can buy a machine that's about the size of an MRI machine and it will fire neutrons straight through your body and you can send a boron atom into the cancer cell with a protein. The neutron will hit the boron, it'll explode and it'll kill the cancer. So it's an example of fusion on the commercial marketplace doing some good. So it's an exciting spin-off technology. Uh, last, I just want to mention helium production. People have talked about that for a long time, but I don't think anybody's really tried. And also I've heard just through casual conversations and emails with people that you can't really make a lot of money doing helium production because we are taking hydrogen to make helium. And at one time there was an international helium shortage. So people talked about maybe spinning that out into a, a production facility. Um, one last thing. It's unclear at this point that going this route is necessarily cheaper than going after fusion, although I think long-term that's gonna to prove to be true. Going after nuclear fusion power is gonna be a very high price endeavor, probably. Um, but going this way, right now, there isn't very much difference in the amount of money you have to put in, but I'm sure long-term that'll probably shake out. Okay, so summary and conclusions. Uh, I, I, didn't, I hadn't mentioned this, but my numbers are rough in terms of financing, but I roughly estimate that we're about $2 billion, $1.9 billion invested in 29 groups, two of them are defunct, employing about 830 people roughly. Um, 
as I said earlier, my numbers are coming from press releases, SBR filings, public filings, et cetera. In some cases, they are guesses based on casual conversations with people who work at the firms, but that's rare where we are right now. And that's over a period of maybe 15 years. But most of the money has come in the last uh, five years. So if you wind the clock back to say 2014, I'd say there were probably half as many groups and probably just well under a billion and probably three or 400 people. So that is my presentation. Are there any questions? Matt, I did have a question. Okay. In regards to the investors themselves, if there's a lot of the investments come in the last, say, five years, uh, what does the, the makeup of the investor base look like and how has that changed? Well, it's, it's, it's a mix. Um, there are a number of angel investors or people that just love the technology. And of course, they're going to they're gonna give their amounts. Um, the, the major, there's been two big strategic partner investments. So for instance, an oil company invested in General Fusion. Um, an oil company invested in Commonwealth Fusion. ENN, the Italian oil company, invested about 50 million in Commonwealth. In General Fusion's case, they actually won a $45 million uh, amount from the Canadian federal government. Um, so in, I just think in general, there's just more interest and that's driving more investment. I wouldn't say there's any one trend. Uh, I would say that money comes from strategic partners, which are oil companies or, or energy companies generally, venture capitalists, um, a little bit harder, and then angels. So you have your three different pots. And as a, as a startup or an entrepreneur, you have to figure out which pot works best for you. And people have found success with different groups at different times.